So, is this your off season? If you had to, have, if you had described that you were having one, would it be now? Yeah, I guess so. I, I would more so say when I touch down in Australia is when I feel like mentally off season starts. Like uh, when I come back and start of December, because now it's the Tour de France route reveal. I'm going to Paris in a couple of days, and there for a few days. Also, that's when I meet up with ASO because they're there, obviously, and uh, negotiating contracts and new races or whatever. Uh, or just checking in with them. So, no, I wouldn't really feel. For me, it's not really the off season. Whereas, like a lot of the pros that are at the beach, or actually, that's not true. A lot of them are still here. I see them mm. training or they're running or something. Maybe November's more when it's true off season. Uh, yeah, I I was speaking with Georgie Howard just a couple of days ago. She's she's next on the pod, and we got our times mixed up. It's meant to be last week, but she's coming back to Australia on Christmas Eve. Really? Yeah. Oh, I guess the riders have camps. The riders I feel bad for because they basically have month off, maybe three yeah. four weeks off in November, and then yeah, it starts back again. Their twenty twenty four season training started December, so their Christmas. Unless you're on Jayco, did Jayco do? An Australian based December camp? I don't think so. I think they traditionally have done it somewhere weird. Remember, they used to do it in South Africa for some of the years as well. But yeah, they used to do it in South Africa. They used to do like the 200Ks every day for a week. Yeah, yeah. I think that was maybe when they had MP and he was kind of that, that South African link. And, but I don't think they do one here. I think some of the boys get together and do a bit of training, but not the whole team. Yeah. Uh, Ineos used to with Froome all the time. He came to the the Gold Coast a lot. Like I remember, I rode past him in 2018 at Northern New South Wales near um, Mwilumba. It might have even been Sivakov. I was like, "What the hell?" Um, yeah, yeah. I can't remember why they have Australian coach uh, from the Gold Coast, but mm. I reckon that's a really good spot. Actually, if you're doing the TDU, the Gold Coast beforehand is is pretty sweet. Yeah, well, it's funny you mentioned that because that was you would have seen earlier this year from doing the Melbourne morning, and that was because he yeah. stayed on after TDU and he just liked the training, liked the climate. And I think he was staying with Simon Clark and his and Clark, his brother, right? And um, I think yeah, if someone reached out, it might have been uh, oh, it might have been you know John Trevor if he um or someone else and said oh you know come ride this Melbourne Warney for a bit of training and um you yeah, know the race you know flicked him some money to his to his charity he didn't actually take any money to raise and um I don't know if you saw the story right cuz I I I was coming over to do the commentating for it and um as I landed the race organizer Karen rang me up she goes oh guess what and I said oh you know what she goes oh Froomey's get a race and I was like what the Melbourne Warney <laughs> What? And yes. you know, the funny thing was is that he was staying in Bright at the at the time, and he was going to fly in the morning of. And the the weather conditions were horrendous, like so bad. It was blowing a gale, and the race was starting at Avalon Airport. And um, he was literally flying to the airport with his bike in like a one seater plane, like propeller right. stuff. And then going to get off and, and race. And because the, there was really bad weather in Bright, there was really low clouds. And that's a takeoff. That's a runway where you have to, you know, you have to visually see before you're allowed to take off. And so it was getting really, really touch and go. And they weren't even sure if he was going to be out of a race, like even though he promoted it and everything. And right. uh, luckily, uh, the pilot, you know, managed to find a window to take off, which he really, the pilot didn't want to take off, but they had to get him here. And the race was delayed by like nine minutes. The whole race is waiting at the right. start line. All the NRS boys are just going, what are we doing here? Froomey rocks up on this shitty plane. Well, you know, just a prop plane. And he's got his kid on. He's trying to get gels in his pocket. He's, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I remember he, oh yeah, he used to stay and do Herald Sun Tour back in the day. Uh, in like 2014, 15, it was a great edition of Herald Sun Tour. Mm. I think there was up Arthur's seat a few times. And he he attacked Kenick, his teammate, who'd helped him win the Tour de France. He was in the leader's jersey. This was like the OG Roglic yeah. finger guard against Coos, but this was in Herald Sun Tour, man. Yeah. He attacked him. And I remember, uh, I, was, I think JC Driver or Joe Cooper, Queensland, Joe Stra Cooper. Yeah. Queensland Strava goat. <laughs> he, he was actually, I feel like he should have got more of a going world tour anyway. 
he's like he's got every KOM just about in the Gold Coast or did. And he, I think he was racing then, and that he was really strong in that. They're like, "What is Froome doing? Like, it's a two dot one race, <laughs> lovely yeah. race, but we're attacking his team. I guess he's got that killer instinct. Uh, but yeah, he's always seems to have loved ri- riding in Australia. I think it's, I would rather train in if you're not doing altitude because you can't do it in Oz. Wouldn't yeah. you rather spend January, February in Australia than? Sierra Nevada, which is cold then, or even Tay Day, be boring too. At least you got something to do. I mean, yeah, yeah. It's funny you say JC Driver, mate. I literally have been saying that name all week because he's racing <laughs> an NRS <laughs> race <laughs> yeah. at the moment. And I, I saw him on the start line. The goat like, man, the JC Driver. <laughs> love that. Oh, yeah, I used to every KOM you just about take, and then now I think Queensland, like. Jay Vine and people have oh Seb Berg's got a few hidden ones actually. Mm. You won't like me saying this, but I think he's got the Gravat KOM, but he's got it on private. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so good. I never uh, get to talk about this usually because people most of the people listening to my podcast about what is a Mount Gravat? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In Brisbane. Oh um, you know, Gold Coast, right? I remember a few years ago, um, at it was a junior road nationals, right? And maybe five, four or five years ago, and I used to take the WA team over. And the road race circuit for the Gold Coast that year, this is for juniors, under-17s, under-15s, the circuit, mate, it went up the – you know where that dam is? So there's a dam in Gold Hins Coast. Dam, near yeah. the back of, near the back of uh, Beachmont. Yeah. So it went up the service road up the dam and <laughs> back down the other side. You know, that it's like – yeah, yeah. The course was horrendous. Like trying to picture this, everyone listening, it's like imagine one a one road, like a one car wide service road that climbs up to the top of the dam, really steep, three minute climb, and then it bombs down, and it's only one lane wide. And on either side of that road, there's those, you know, it's like a rock pool, you know, like rock. <laughs> yeah, it's really one. sketchy, man. <laughs> and it was. It's raining. fine when you're, you're tourist. Oh yeah, and it was raining, mate. So. You know, in the end, there were that many crashes on the way down, these poor kids just like washing out. And I reckon there would be quite a few who are listening now that would have raced that particular junior nationals. And there were so many kids that were crashing and landing in the rocks that there weren't enough ambulances to take them to the hospital and Jesus. get back around. It was, a t- it was a terrible course. But, you know, apart from that. I think they got the Com Games, right, because Melbourne flicked the Com Games, so the Gold Coast is hosting it, I think. And I, okay. I was a little bit disappointed with the Com Game circuit. Uh, mm. in twenty eighteen, I think they just went up Avocado Street, and I know. And then Wollongong did pretty much the same thing. They just mm. had like a random suburban mm. hill as the defining moment of the race, and then it, you know finished on the beach front in Corumban, the Com Games. But oh, there's so many good roads they could do. Uh, I hope if they do have the road race and the Com Games, they can. They don't need to use Panorama or something ridiculous, but <laughs> yeah. And Springbrook's closed, but it'd be great if they could. Um, I mean, I love a mountaintop finish. There's not enough road races finishing with a mountaintop finish, just for mm-hmm. something different. Mm. Well, I think they're going to test the Olympic course for 2032. I reckon. Oh, they'll come, okay. They'll either try and test maybe the circuit or certain parts of the course, so that way they can test how their resources stack up. You know, they've got enough police. You know, enough road closures. Yeah. I reckon they'll use it as a tester. Yeah. Okay. I mean, they got to do something special for the Olympics. I think it's got to be a little bit more like Makuni was pretty, like Tokyo was pretty special where you can mm. see Mount Fuji mm. and they can't do something like when Brisbane had the Com Games, the old circuit, I think, is near the Sleeman Center around Chandler. And yeah. it's like, you can't have an Olympic course like that. You got to have, I don't know, something showing Australia a bit better, I think, to the world. Mm-hmm. Um, do you uh, when you come when you finally do get your off season? Do you and your wife both come back to Australia, or has she already come back earlier, or did you come back together? And no, so she she works with me in the, the LR business, so we come back together. Um, nice. So she like she comes to Paris and you know takes maybe it takes video or helps film content as well, or um, even dealing with ASO as well, like helping with the contracts with that uh, yeah. as well. So yeah, she's. We come back at the same time and then go to the yeah. Gold Coast. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's nice. Wicked. And uh, how long will you be staying in Australia before you have to go back? Will you stay through like the Aussie summer and then, you know, 
a bit shorter this time, probably like nine weeks, ten weeks, yeah. um, and go back uh, when the first races start. So like uh, when our Garve starts or I think uh, Valenciana starts the 2nd of February, so I'll be back for that yeah. in Spain. Yeah. Um, it's okay. a bit annoying it's covering it from there. I actually, instead of moving to Andorra, I looked first at moving to Perth or because I thought, <laughs> oh, could Perth with the time zone? It's, it's so much better. Is. And if you're just if you're just watching the European races, just watching finishes, you go to sleep. Perth is beautiful. Tour mm-hmm. de France. When did that Tour de France stage just finish? Ten fifteen. No, oh, about yeah, about eleven. About eleven. Okay. Okay. Start. Yeah. But still, you right. can cop that. You can oh. still like go to have a normal job the next day. But then I did the yeah. maths. I was like, if I've got to work after, then still make yes podcasts and videos and stuff after that. Perth or Singapore is still not possible. Yeah, yeah, that's that's as soon as I'm finished a stage, I'm yeah, I've got no energy to do anything else. You do extra <laughs> stuff. Yeah, I think um, that's it's a big move though, isn't it? Like when you made that move over to Europe, I mean, that's a big step, and there were lots of boxes still to tick off, I imagine, before you even left. Yeah, well, I I had the deal with ASO signed and everything, so I had the rights agreement with them for three years. So I had a bit of security with that. I thought, okay, well, the YouTube channel is going to have. A bucket load of content for mm. for three years um and also you know costs a lot so i i gotta maximize the most of it i can't be uploading the videos the next day from australia um <laughs> and they're gonna get way less views than if i do it straight away in europe when i'm fresher mm. in the afternoon and it's also during peak covid when australia had uh you had to apply to the government to leave so that yeah. was obviously very very fun um doing that and they say you can never come back <laughs> at that yeah, point yeah um that was great and so yeah it was obviously um, and or you can't look up anything online especially in english like it it doesn't exist just about in terms of information or you know it's a small principality and i've never been there all spain and obviously before i yeah never even been to spain before so yeah that was a big step but jack jack Haig recommended andorra to me and said you know move there and so i did i didn't i didn't go to girona as like an intermediate step uh either yeah okay and i mean i've always been fascinated with like how you um how you started the conversation with aso to like that must have seemen when you i mean i'm not sure i'd love to know how you sort of went in you know started the discussions with them because in my mind you know they would have been quite Ah, I mean, I just would assume they'd be a little bit, well, who's this guy rolling in, you know, wanting rights? Has anyone even done that before? Um, Yeah, it was difficult. Like a lot of it, that was extremely difficult, the first contract to get that agreed. That took five months well, probably Yeah, because they'd never done a deal like that before, I don't think. Yeah. Um, yeah. Normally they – normally people don't want to buy just the digital rights. They mm-hmm. – how it normally was then in 2020 would have been a broadcaster buys the live rights and they get the digital rights for free under some you know conditions so even then I'm not sure they you know pricing up the digital rights package was it probably a new thing for them but maybe they had done it before um, but maybe they'd done it not on the same scale where most people say ah can we have the Tour de France but I was coming in I said I want Volta Catalunya I want Tour of Oman I yeah. want everything yeah. you got. I want, I want the women's races in your portfolio, which yeah. is actually, I think they, I think that was, the, if I just come in and said, I want to buy the Tour de France rights, I think they would never have happened. It was because I wanted to put the same effort into their whole portfolio, which is what most people don't want to do that, you know, I'm probably going to make Deutschland Diner Tour they have in their portfolio. And it was on during the Vuelta. I didn't have time to do the videos. I'm probably now going to go back and make some videos. Mm covering those stages again um so i think that was yeah but it was difficult to help being a lawyer obviously because like the contracts you know 20 30 pages long mm. a lot of complicated stuff in there um and also telling them what i wanted in the contract already like pre-drafted helped a lot nice. um but yeah i basically cold emailed them i didn't have a connect yeah. didn't have a reference from somebody I literally just cold emailed them and just like, all right, because I got no a lot. And then I just found the right person, uh, Anthony Pivato, actually, who's now moved into their uh, international development 
part of ASO. He's really, really good. He's a hitter. He's a hitter there. And he was probably about my age. I think that really helped. And I think he really pushed it um, as well. Yeah. Yeah. It helped having someone maybe who could see it. He he got it. Yeah. Yeah. And this was pre-Netflix. And now I think, you know, I think that was also I came at the right time where they were in part of a transition where they so wanting to reach a different audience, reach an anglophone audience and a younger audience. And they're like, all right, that sounds good. Obviously, you know, I also had to do a good job as well. Um, otherwise, it wouldn't have, you know, they could have just cancelled it. Mm. Mm. Do you remember the first video you ever made, like in the in the sort of the highlights package thing? Because I, I remember watching the old OG stuff, mate, like when it was, 720p mate and you it was like old Nairo like you know you'll take back some of the old highlights I wonder if you remember what the first one was the first ever one was a Giro Donna oh no that was in 2019 well one of the first anyway it was a women's video it was a Giro Donna race won by um well the Voss or something I can't can't remember her name no it's a Prequay win she's she appears on the cycling podcast uh, English writer anyway Lizzie Banks Oh, and then oh, yeah. the one that actually popped off was the Egan Bernal Tour de l'Avenir stage win in 2017. And so I went back. He just won the Tour. Yeah. And so I went back and looked at him winning Tour de l'Avenir stage two years before because um, people wouldn't have seen that. People still yeah. don't see that. Like people, like if Keanu Brooks wins the Tour de France, for example, the Belgian rider on Bora, yeah. if, you make, if someone makes a video – of him winning the Queen stage of the Tour de Lavigne last year, say in five years, there's going to be a lot of people interested in that because they won't have watched it. Mm. Yeah, um, that's, a good, that's a good call. I think Naira like, was good. <laughs> that, yeah, that, 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 there's some real rippers in there, man. Um, like, I think uh, you know the way you started making your videos from those from the highlights packages, you know, emulates a lot of what. You know, some of the other sports do that do it really well online. You know, like NBA are so good with their highlights. Formula One are so good with their highlights, but they don't just post. It's not just highlights of the races. It's all those little bits like you just mentioned. It's the, you know, I don't know Sergio Perez and Gasly when they were ten years old racing carts. Like there's videos. Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. That's those things are what people love watching. But there isn't that much. There wasn't that really around for cycling on YouTube or anywhere really i think the netflix series i was a bit uh skeptical about how successful it would be but i think it actually has been pretty successful even in the first year they renewed it obviously for next year as well um i think that's actually been pretty good and a lot of i think all a lot of cycling fans watched it and then i think it's actually reached a fair few people definitely it, we've noticed from nothing we did the numbers on podcasts or videos seem to uptick now, could be anything, could just because we're great, but I, I doubt it. Um, <laughs> I think it was, then I think there was a bit of a Netflix effect from that. So I think things are moving in the right direction. Obviously, the sport's not, it's not F1 um, in terms of the money involved, but I think, mm-hmm. I think it's moving generally in the right direction. Uh, maybe in where we're from or America, no, in terms yeah. of local participation, I don't know. Uh, exactly, because I've not been living in Australia for a few years, but certainly in America, it seems in road racing's struggling. Maybe, you know, will the trickle down effect from the popularity of the world tour help that in America or Australia, UK? Not sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, oh, actually, the last thing I wanted to ask is: is your this is a video everyone has to watch. If you haven't seen it already, it's my, I reckon it's just a classic meme video. But is the Joe Biden video still number one? Yeah, yeah that's the biggest piece of content <laughs> I ever made. I made that in five minutes, the Joe Biden short. Sleepy it's, Joe. Because uh, oh. most of the comments when I open up the homepage on YouTube is just like people basically yeah people abusing joe biden and <laughs> calling him sleepy joe and i'm like what and i realized oh yeah i made a, fi- a short that took me five minutes about him falling off a bike so yeah, yeah 
Please go click on everyone. It's Sleepy Joe getting his foot caught in the uh, toe straps of like a commuter bike. It is good with a slow mo. It's the toe straps. It's, you know, it could happen to anyone, you know. Those yeah. toe straps they are actually like no one should use those things. I don't know why anyone gave him a bike with those. Oh, there's no security clearance on those toe straps. Do you remember yeah. the first time you fell off wearing like clip in shoes? Yeah. Good. Probably the first time I rode a bike. I was just, uh, I did the river loop with, um, with my mate Ian, who introduced me to cycling, just mm. at a stop sign. He was sort of, he could, he was a good rider when you had to ride well. And he was like, not track standing, but just slow down. And I, and I basically didn't know how to moderate the brakes at all and just like <laughs> stopped. And then was like, oh shit, there's a next step unclipping. But your brain hadn't, yeah, yeah when you yeah. first get in, yeah. didn't realize that. And then bang, straight so, out. Mm. Yeah. Even here, I haven't actually fallen down on clipping here, but, you know, it's crazy to me that people here unclip with their right foot because because if there's a curb on the right-hand side of the road, you're you're riding on the right-hand side of the road, you just want to put your foot on the curb at a light, you'd unclip your right foot. But I I, I don't I can barely unclip my right foot. When I had first put my clipless pedals on, I remember I was riding to uni and I was, I was almost there and I was going to stop at some lights and I'd ridden past someone already and he was just in flats. And I was like, you know, whatever. I rode past him, got to the lights, fully binned it, like couldn't clip out and know what I was doing. I was just a mess and fell over the floor. And the guy, he rode past me and he was just sort of like 40, 50-year-old dude. He was like, that's why I don't wear clip-ins, mate. And then he just kept riding. <laughs> I was still on the floor. I was like, bro, it's my first time. <laughs> Jeez. Rough. <laughs> yeah, no, I think cycling, yeah, it's probably I would go to like a, the Nunder Dome in a crit track or something to learn in if I had to do it again rather than just learning how to clip in on open roads. <laughs> <laughs> Although during the weekday when we're uni students, River Loop is pretty quiet in Brisbane. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, well, it's not Yumbo anymore, is it? It's, Visma Lisa, Lisa Bike or is it higher bike? Lisa Bike. It's not confirmed yet. I don't think the name, but yeah, that's what Vila okay. Fitz has said. It's Visma Lisa Bike. Doesn't exactly roll off the tongue, but um, yeah, none of them really do until uh, you say it, you know, 10 times throughout the season. I don't know, but um, yeah, uh, you know, it's really interesting that you, if you're sort of working with, with their that as a team, that must have been quite a cool little, um, oh, I'd say a really nice opportunity that's opened up off the back of what you've created with the YouTube channel and, and the podcast and everything. Um, and I I wonder, do you reckon other teams will, and just for uh, maybe just explain what you do for um, Visma um, at the moment, and I'll just ask the question after that. Yeah, so I started initially as a, with Benji as a video analyst in the first year, so it was 2022. And then it, it evolved a little bit more than that. And so now I do, I still do that. So, for example, chopping up footage to show particular moments or mistakes or even what other people are doing. Um, sometimes I watch a random 2.1 French race like the Tour de Limousin, see the way a team use two riders and i think that's really good uh obviously it's not the tour de france but there's some concepts in there that that are really interesting so there's that of course um so yeah video is a, a core component of it and then what sort of happened a lot more this year is scouting uh mm. scouting other riders mm. uh because pcs can only tell you so much yeah. um so scouting for signings you know, scouting your own riders and some money ball stuff with that. And yeah. then also a big one is race planning. So for the major races, all the monuments, all the grand tours, planning strategies for opponents, each stage, all that stuff, um, mm-hmm. and how to approach them. So that's been that's been really interesting this year. And also then doing now at this point of the year, it's more like in the how do we go evaluation part of the year so uh, that's actually been quite a lot of work at at the moment so that's why i don't really feel like i'm in off season yet yeah okay so that's that sounds like a lot of detail and it seems to me maybe the last wow since you really this role began maybe the most of the teams might have had 
one person doing uh, or lots of different people sort of chipping at those targets. And I wonder, do you think maybe going forward, do, will other teams start to bring on analysts like yourself to, oh, to, they to have to those roles? You know, that seems like something that has to occur. People assume that this is already happening at each World Tour team, right? But that's that's not the case. You, I look at a lot of World Tour teams, and to me, it looks like three or four staff members get to pick one or two riders they like to hire each year, and they may be a DS. They may be a general manager. Like A lot of teams don't have a highly structured, uh, like a head of scouting recruitment process. Yeah. yeah where that person is responsible for signings. Of course, you know, you can get feedback. Maybe a soigneur has seen, has got a tip from somebody. That's, of course, important information to bring in. But, um, yeah, so that's sort of the structure of it, I think, will surely be replicated in other teams, one would think. But, yeah, the video analysis, I guess you got to find people to do it. And I guess World Tour teams need to pay for it too. Um, sure. So... You're not going to find someone to do to chop up footage for you and pay them. Pennies. Maybe there's a university student who wants to do it um, for nothing, but yeah, it's it's also ha- wanting to invest in that. And a lot of the teams don't have a lot of money uh, mm. to invest in that sort of thing. They maybe they want to invest on altitude. You, you got a toss up. So do I go on this altitude camp? Do we get the better nutrition sponsor who pays less money than the Worst nutrition sponsor is going to pay us more money. Mm. You know, it's it's all these things as well. The teams have to decide if it's worth it and if there's the right person. Um, mm. But yeah, I think in other sports now, like maybe the first Premier League team to get a video analyst was the first one, and now they all have a team of these people. So yeah. surely it will continue to evolve. Mm. I wonder. And then how? At what point? Will other teams, I mean, I'm sure this happens already in other roles, well, it definitely does with directors and stuff, but at what point will other teams start to go, geez, you know, this guy or girl's making waves at that team, let's go poach them, you know, start staff, start getting swapped around. No, I, um, well, I'm sure Yumbo isn't the only team that's, you know, would like services that you do, mate. Yeah, I think sometimes, I think it's difficult to know exactly what I do. That sometimes... Other teams don't know, but some of the Anglophone teams do. I think FDJ probably don't know I exist. Uh, that's <laughs> fine. <laughs> but, um, yeah. But yeah, it's, there's staff moving. So the Norway, uh, not Norway, Unix's head of performance just got I uh, saw that poached means, right? to Yumbo Visma. Yeah. And then Wout wow, Van Aert's coach, Mark Lamberts, mm-hmm. he is going to Bora with Roglic. So yeah, there's staff staff movements or even Velasco was at Astana uh, as their like uh, Pinotti guy the Jayco's mm-hmm. got like Pinotti he's like the aero he's really good with the TT stuff Velasco mm-hmm. was at Astana he did really well there and then Movistar took him so I think or Bigum Bigum's now at Ineos yeah. um, will someone try and poach him after seeing how good their TT stuff has, has been under him mm-hmm. not that it wasn't it was it was good before as well but he's obviously he lifted it yeah yeah, so I don't know. I don't know. It, de- it depends also on, yeah, as I said, the investment of it because I think staff are generally speaking compared to the rider salaries maybe underpaid in World Tour because they do it for the love that they want to be involved in the sport, et cetera. Yeah. Hmm. Is there anything, Patrick, that uh, – well, maybe I'm sure there's lots, but is there any particular thing that – you know that a lot of World Tour teams are still doing now with regards to how they structure, plan, and set up their team that is really just way out of date, you know, like just something that's just, you know, it might be a team like FDJ doing something really old school, but what's something that stands out to you that you're still very surprised that teams are still doing? I I guess bringing one-dimensional teams to a a grand tour Mm -hmm. is something I think is just inexcusable. Like unless you have Pagacha, who's going to win you some stages anyway, or Vingegaard, and even Yumbo don't do this. They still send Van Aert to the Tour mm. to win sprints or Laporte to win sprints. Um, if you have a second or third tier GC contender, he does not need six climbing domestiques or four climbing domestiques because unless all those climbing domestiques are as good as Sepp Kuss, 
they're going to get dropped by Rafael Micah and Sepp Kuss before they can even do anything or help. Mm. Um, one guy's good to have there when it's a group of 20 or 15 to maybe get a bid on to check how um, the leader's going. So Chris Harper, for example, was really good in that role for Simon Yates at the Tour. I like Jaco's team construction at the Tour, actually, with Yates, Harper, maybe could have had one more climbing domestique. And then Kronenwegen and his train, I think, and Bora do the same thing. Mm. Next team, and I think the way FDJ did it with no sprinter in their home big race with all those sprints, um, all in on Gadu, it just is pointless because none of those the riders that replaced Demar and say Scotson were he. I think Demar wanted Scotson, and that was it. Yeah, a pilot, and um, those two riders that replaced him and Scotson made no tangible difference to go to his GC at all. It's pointless. Mm. Um, another one is lead outs. So maybe with Jayco, I'm looking at Jayco signing you and I'm like, they they barely had one good lead out this year squad. Where are they going to get two from? Mm. Um, so that's another one is a lot of people, a lot of sprinters, a lot of, but not so many, I can barely name 10 professional lead outs. Who I'm, I think are good, because uh, like even Laporte does it part time, and yeah. Vanderpool does it part time. Yeah, yeah. Well, it leads into the my next topic. I did want to ask um, your thoughts about Ewan. It is what I think, right, Patrick? Okay. I think <laughs> I, I think uh, I think Caleb. I reckon this is good for Caleb moving to an Australian team, mainly I think it'll do a lot of good for his PR, you know, because he's not really one to do many interviews or anything like that. And I feel like because he doesn't do much media, when he's not winning, which has been, you know, the last three years, probably last, you know, 2019, yeah, last three years, when he's not winning, you know, he wants to do even less. And all you see is him, you know, down the dumps or sort of, you know, talking about his team or vice versa. It, it doesn't look good either way. And I feel like him moving to the Australian team, everyone in Jayco's, there's a nice energy there. They do good social media. I think it'll help lift his, the perception of him a little bit outside of his phys- physical ability and just help him be a bit more well-liked because, I don't know, it feels like Caleb's almost like a European before he's an Aussie. I guess, does he come back much? I mean, not really. he to you this year? Uh can't remember. If he did, I don't I think, think he, he did. Did he win the Schwalbe Classic? He won oh, the Schwalbe Classic. Okay, the People's Choice Classic. Yeah, okay. And yeah. He, I'm not sure if he did. He didn't do he did nationals could, though. He did nationals. He came. I'm just looking at PCS now. And he came sixth in in Cadell's. So he's actually going all right. Okay, all right. But he rode for UniSA. So that's to your oh, point. That- that's why. That's right. why I forgot. Yeah, to your point, Lotto didn't even send a team to TDU. That's right. Um, and so he was there with UniSA mm. with, you know, trying to freelance a lot of it himself. Um, yeah, it's tough. Yeah, obviously the falling out with Lotto wasn't great on both sides. I think Stefan Hulo is the CEO. He said, I oh, regrets maybe panning Caleb in the media during the tour. Yeah. That doesn't mean what he said was wrong. Yeah. But maybe he shouldn't have said it in the media. Um, so whether it's a good signing for Jayco, I guess it depends. All it always depends That's on what the money. Paying. Because, for example, and this won't be the case, if Lotto Destiny just really wanted him off the team so badly that they're paying his entire twenty twenty four salary, and Jayco get Caleb Ewan for free, of course you do that. Yeah, hundred every time. If Jayco are eating his whole salary, then it's like well. Now I'm not sure because, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, but maybe somewhere in the middle would be my guess. I don't know. Uh, mm-hmm. I question Scotson looked good in Crow Race. He was good for Matthews in the Giro. They should have sent him to the Tour with Gronovegan, but mm-hmm. they want to have Rangers and um, Jan Maas or whoever around him to speak Dutch. And who's going to be the lead out for Caleb? Is sort of the question I have. Kel's good in like a third man role, yeah. so yeah, setting that up will be will be really really important. But I think the tour is good. Second on the the first sprint, third in the second sprint, you can't come top three 
back to back in a Tour de France sprint without being at a very, very good level. Um, yeah. yeah. So I, I got no no concerns that at his age, he has the physical capacity to win big, big races still. Mm. It's just whether the chemistry is right, the team environment's right, he's right. Um, that remains to be seen. Mm. There's a lot to be said just from being in a, an environment where you're enjoying your cycling. Definitely feels like in the last two years he hasn't been enjoying it, hasn't seen that way. And how could you? Yeah. Had those just like. Well, Sagan crashed him in the tour last year, no, in like stage three. Oh, the stage I, Melier one ahead of Philipson. Sagan I, yeah, didn't he and chop, crashed him. I think yeah. he, Caleb, like just hit his wheel. I don't yeah. know if Sagan was there, but then the year yeah, after. Yeah, I don't think Sagan was at fault. I think he, there they. Cho- he, yeah. But he yeah, got the best. They... I don't know. I think Caleb just got his front wheel. That's right. Hooked, you know, and then he did the same the next year on that uphill would, with Benny in Hungary. Yeah, you, yeah. You, were, you were there, right? Uh, but he was looking good on that stage. It's just uh, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. On you know. six and Cadell's is even a good result. I know it's it not the actually. biggest race, but it's a hard circuit, and he like so that's not a sprint pure sprinter's course. So mm. Mm. yeah, I think. The physical level is there, some bad luck. Also, like, let's be honest, if you're a lotto in a relegation battle and you see Caleb stop trying for fourth and third for UCI points, Good point. not exactly going to endear you to staff or to your teammates who are, you know, potentially if a team gets relegated, could sponsors pull out, could salaries go down. So Good there's point. also two sides of the coin as well to are you enjoying your cycling? Um, yeah. Do you, uh, what, what influences you had on, uh, I mean, it might be harder now with just your, you know, the role you take up in, in cycling media now, but how do you, do you have a favorite cyclist and what are the things that influence that decision? Favorite cyclist? Probably, I like, I like Domestiques, like Nelson Oliveira, like Castro Viejo. Yeah. Um, who else? Tratnik, real like Tratnik. Quite Guys out. like that. Versatile domestiques who are just on their day can randomly be super strong in the mountains, like Castro was in 2021 tour. Yeah. Um, I really like Castro Viejo. And so, yeah, that's, hmm. that's basically because it's not, it's probably when you watch cycling all day, it'd be a bit boring to be like a fan of like some of the Windsor race. It's better to be a fan of sort of some of the unsung heroes. And because now that I watch it so much and, and working with the team as well, you realize how important riders like that are. Like, I don't think people realize how important Van Hooydonk was to a lot of Yumbo's wins mm. and his unfortunate retirement. You know, that's a huge gap. That's, you can't just replace him with just a random mm. ruler uh, and expect the same results. So, yeah, I like I like those sort of guys. Mm. Do you like Kwiatkowski? He's sort of in yeah. the Yeah. I love him. I like Kwiato. Uh, mm. especially yeah. I loved, you know, just seeing him randomly on the Glib- uh yeah, the Glibier this year. Just torch everybody. I was like, <laughs> holy. Because UA were chasing really hard. He wins that tour stage and then on Col de la Lowe's, he drops Poggy at the yeah. end. It's like wow. So him and Castro were killing it that day. Mm. The old yeah. sky guys I like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The OG. I've actually got. I have a. Um, did you ever meet Russ Ellis, the photographer? No. Okay. Well, he's he's cycling images on Instagram. He's he's, okay. he's a, he goes around, does all the um, all the world tour races. Legend of a guy. And we were working together briefly here in Perth, and um, he he actually gave me Kwiatkowski's, um race numbers. Uh, after the Champs Elysees when they won the tour, maybe twenty. 15. I also won the, the team's classification, so the yellow. So I've got his number. It's just That's a random, sweet. random bit of memorabilia, but I always look at it and Russ just gave it to me like it was nothing. Like it hasn't been used <laughs> either, just fresh. And I was like, mate, you know, <laughs> it was just one of those cool things. Yeah. Well, I mean, who's the most popular Australian rider right now? I want to know what from the people on the ground. Who is the most popular? Hinley won the Giro. O'Connor's like very aggressive and attacking. You reckon it's Hindley? No, I don't think it's Hindley. I'm wearing the shirt, everyone. But um, yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. The most po- oh, I think it's. I actually think it's well, Bling, Bling's on Jayco. 
Did he win a Giro stage this year? No, he didn't. I don't think he did. He didn't have a very good year. No. Strange schedule. Maybe. I reckon it's... I mean, it could be Giants. Yeah, Giants pretty popular. Maybe someone like a, I don't know, like a Durbridge. I mean, Plappy's pretty popular. Um, but still. That's a, yeah, that's like the interesting question is yes. like, we got a lot of good riders at the moment. I mean, Dennis is retiring. Caden's coming up. But, like, for example, Caden doesn't have the longevity of his name being in the media as a mm-hmm. Matthews, and he also hasn't done the tour. Doesn't and do so. You got you yeah. you gotta you gotta do the tour, I think, to break into the broader consciousness of the sort of fringe cycling public. Um, I think you have to be also. You've got to be have a massive victory of some sort, really notable or really yeah. amazing performance that you've done more than once, and then you also have to have. You have to have done lots of media, I think. Like you're gonna yeah. have that personality. And often they don't intertwine or the, the Venn diagram where they connect isn't so large. Joe Vine's pretty well known and popular, and he won TDU as well. And like people, you know, know his story. I think Hinley probably had the biggest Australian win this year, right? Tour stage plus taking yellow week one of the tour. It's hard yeah. to get bigger than that. So yeah. We're in yellow. But then I think if he if he kicked onto podium, then the top you know, five. Like yeah, he had that crash. That sucked. That was unlucky. Um, I think it could be Caleb. if Caleb comes back and he wins like two tour stages. No, I don't think he'll do the tour. If he wins like three Giro stages and does well, I think Caleb because he's got that longevity in the mm. yeah the public's consciousness. Uh, even though if Caden might be, Caden might be our best rider right now. Mm. God, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's a tough one. I mean, that's just on the men's side. I mean, even on the women's is – who would be the women's? Most, most Maybe Spratty? Spratt would be the most well-known, and even Trex this year kept making Riolini right as a domestique for her, <laughs> even though Riolini was way better than Spratt in certain <laughs> yeah. races. So that um, was confusing. But I like Brody, obviously, but she's not like a big winner. Yeah. And Brody's got a great personality. Yeah. Um, probably the up and coming, like someone like Ruby, Ruby, Ruby Roseman Gunn, just signed the extension. That's a good if extension. She, if she, yeah, if she can, she, her or Manly, if they can win a tour stage, which is like <laughs> easier said than done against SD Works, yeah. uh, almost impossible, then maybe then. But yeah, Spratty, oh, Grace Brown, I think. I think Grace um, Brown. Good call. It's Grace, it's Grace yeah. Brown, yeah. Yeah, good um, call. He's the best Australian rider right now. Mm. Uh, okay, so I'm going to skip to this last one. I didn't put this on the sheet because I, I couldn't write it down, but this is – I've changed one of these, right? So I'm asking like, – this is at the end of every pod now, and I had to remove the COVID part to this. I didn't have to, but it's like asking which cult would you like to join? And one of them is the COVID deniers. And I didn't think anyone would pick that. <laughs> but Zoe Baxter and Josh Charlie were like, yeah, we'll join those COVID deniers. So I was like, oh. hey, what are my what are my other cult options? Oh, okay. Let me okay, let me read them out. These are the fresh ones. But this is not an answer. Yeah. All right. COVID deniers, we're not going there. So I, mean, I already you- was an altar boy in the Catholic Church for four years. <laughs> so. <laughs> so which cult would you like to join, right? You can join the anti-moon landing cult, my personal favorite. Solid. You can, yeah, you can join the flat earthers, flat earth society, or this is the one I've added. You can join the cult that celebrates the lizard people, who are known as shapeshifters, and who supposedly all oh, the Illuminati, yeah, yeah, and all the world leaders are lizard people that have shapeshifted into humans. I mean, when you see Mitch McConnell freeze sometimes during his speeches, you're like, oh, <laughs> is that a real human or a robot? <laughs> that is a good reference. Oh, I probably, my God. I reckon, I reckon the moon landing. Oh, welcome to the club. Yeah, I could get on board with that one because, first of all, you look at it, you're like, that's so far away. And secondly, didn't they, like, recreate it with a green screen as well for, like, video? Yeah, I mean, and also, why haven't we been back recently? 
So what? When was it in '67 or something? Something like that. Why are we not with the progression of technology from the '60s to now? Surely we should be going. Maybe they are. We should be going. Yeah, every day. Why isn't there a travelator to the moon? So mm. I reckon I it's us. It just I'll, seems I'll join too, that one. I like it. <laughs> I like it. It seems too. You know, we struggled to set up Zoom today, and in the '60s they supposedly streamed a moon landing like that, and they just, survived. And they, they survived. came back, and, and they came back, and they survived. Come on. Oof, oof. Uh, yeah, great answer. I wonder how many people listening are actually moon landing fans. Maybe we're offending some of them. Flat earthers. Yeah, so Zoe and Josh, I had to remove the COVID deniers, but they're not actually COVID <laughs> deniers, but, you know, maybe they're just. <laughs> I never got COVID, I don't think. Somehow oh, no. I avoided it, yeah. Mm. I mean, I'm. Not sure it was the. Uh, I was pretty antisocial, and I moved over to like a. That's another question I had. I keep asking myself: Do I? I'll, I'll ask you a question. Right. Do I live in a rural area or a country area? So here's the factors. I have a main shopping mall within twelve minutes drive. Big shopping mall with everything you got. You know, like a like the main street of Perth, for example, the main shopping area of Perth or right. uh, Queen Street in Brisbane. But my house, from that way, there's 10 kilometers of nothing but mountain. There's two horses that I'm looking at right now in a field that they grow tobacco in. <laughs> um, a deer jumped <laughs> into my garden yesterday and then just looked oh. and jumped out. The village I live in is maybe 150, 200 people. Mm. Is that a rural area? Or country. Yeah. Is there a difference between the two? Um, it com- I think I don't know, <laughs> one has more farmland. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't call it farmland. They grow tobacco because it's kind of a traditional thing to do. Like, I'm not sure it's they're really farming anything. There's some sheep there as well. but hmm. I think the sheep they do eat. Right. Okay. Tobacco, like for smoking darts. So I think I'm not sure the tobacco is any good, but I think there's a law that you can import a quantity of tobacco VAT free, the same quantity that you grow every year. And so I think they just burn it. Oh. So they grow it, burn it, and they say, Oh, we grew 100 kilos of tobacco. We'll import 100 kilos of tobacco, good quality tobacco, duty free. And um, because cigarettes are so cheap here, I think a pack of 20 is like a euro, two euros. There's no vaping here, really. No vaping because if people, my mate lives in London, he's like, Yeah, everyone vapes. I'm like, What? No, they just smoke cigarettes, they smoke, they rip darts because it's so cheap. (laughs) Someone told me the story. I might have been on the cycling podcast, I was listening to it. It was like the reason why they called Pareto Rodriguez. Yeah, that was his nickname, Perito, yeah. because isn't that like a small cigarette? Yeah, a little cigar thing or cigarillo. Yeah. And so apparently yeah. as a junior, he was riding with one of his older teammates and he rode past him on a training camp. His, you know, his older teammate rode past him as if he was smoking a Perito. So yeah. um, that's the reason why. Yeah. yeah, they smoke them here as well. You can smell it from a mile off in, <laughs> in France in particular. Um, oh. But yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'm, people can say whether I live in a rural country area. Maybe it's a bit like Brookfield in Brisbane. Mm. You're close to Indrapilly, but I think it's horsey. I think that's the correct answer. It's horsey. horsey. Like Brookfield is horsey in mm-hmm. Brisbane. I'm sure you've got a similar area in Perth where there's yes horse awesome. schools and stuff. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, are you going to be at TDU? Maybe. Maybe not for as long as uh, I was this year, but uh, I might come down for the last three stages of the men's. Um, mm. See how I'm going. All right. Well, let me know if you do. We can catch up there again. Uh, are they doing the lofty circuit again? Oh, I don't know. That I was know, really I good. Think, I don't think they've released the stages yet, but that was good. That final stage I thought was really good. I yeah. thought the actual, the whole parkour this year actually I thought was really good. There's a crosswind stage, mm. some sprints, an uphill sprint, um, the crit, others, yeah. and then the quite selective 
corkscrew and then lofty stages i thought and then the, the stage dennis won so there was yeah. kind of three gc mm-hmm. relevant stages mm. which yeah. is more than usual that stage that uh spratty and brown came down the what, what, whatever that climb was yeah corkscrew and then corkscrew and then you got our montecute oh that was epic yeah yeah I thought it was really, really good. And then they've got, I think this year, they there's a rumor they're bringing Paramount back, um, which... Paramount. Oh, is, is it Paramount? Or Paracomb? Paracomb, Paracomb. that's right. Yes. Yeah, like 1K, 7% or something. Uh-huh. Uh, that's, oh, that's Dennis, cool. Port, and McCarthy have gone gone to war there. Oh, Willunga's back. I know Willunga's back. Great. I'm pretty sure I read somewhere Willunga's back, so maybe I'll come down for that. Sir Giganti would be stoked with that. And so will Plappy. He wants to take the crown. I think it'd be a good start list. Uh, I think it'd be a good start list. Yeah. All right, Pat, mate, thank you. No worries. Thank you very much. Um, 